So our lab here at Boston University is very interested in treating persistent bacterial infections. What this focuses on are so-called bacteria persisters. These are quasi-dormant bacterial cells that make up a tiny fraction of a bacterial population. Why they're intriguing is that because they're quasi-dormant, they're highly tolerant, that is resistant, to antibiotic treatment and other environmental insults. The thinking now is that bacteria persisters underlie recurrent and persistent infections. So whether it's a little kid that has repeat ear infections, whether it's a college student that has repeat strep infections, an adult that has a chronic or recurrent staph infection or pneumococcal infection or TB infection. In the past, the thinking was, say, on the college student that they'll have their strep, they'll take their erythromycin for two weeks, they're symptom-free, and then a month later they have strep again. The thinking was, well, they're stressed, they just got reinfected. Now the thinking is that they never got rid of the original infection that they wiped out 99% or 99.9% .9 of the infection, but that 1% or 0.1% was laying low. And once they did get stressed and their immune system was weak, it repopulates the infection. Many individuals now are focusing on the mechanisms by which these persisters are formed, including our lab. But we got intrigued a few years ago to think about, could we come up with a way to kill them off? And really approach the challenge of, could we figure out a way to wake them up so that we can knock them out with the antibiotic? And with Kyle Allison and Mark Brynelson, a grad student and postdoc in my lab, I challenged them to take that approach. And what they did was apply a number of different sugars and metabolites to bacterial cultures. And what they found was fascinating. One was that during the time window of interest, the first four to eight hours, these different sugars and metabolites did not wake up the cells. Yes, if you look out 24 hours, 48 hours, you had some, a small number wake up. But during the window we wanted to test, they didn't wake them up. Two was that two different class of antibiotics that we looked at, quinolones and beta-lactams, were not enabled to kill off any of the bacteria as a result of the applied metabolites. But what we found that was stunning is that certain upper, upper glycolytic sugars, like mannitol, like fructose, like glucose, enabled aminoglycosides, like gentamicin, canamycin, tobramycin, to eradicate the bacterial persisters. And so we sat back and said, wow, what's going on here? You know, the, the cells aren't waking up. And we used the system's biology analyses, both metabolic and gene regulatory, to try to analyze what was happening. And we did a series of phenotypic studies. And what we uncovered was that in the persisters, when they're untreated, even with the antibiotic, but untreated with the metabolites, they weren't taking up the aminoglycosides. So the aminoglycosides couldn't get inside the cell. But we showed that these certain metabolites actually now enabled the aminoglycosides to get in. And our mechanistic analyses uncovered that what the sugars were doing was basically triggering what's known as proton motor force, which is uh, uh, basically shift in the metabolic dynamics, respiration of the cell across the membrane that allows the cells, tricks the cells into taking up aminoglycosides. It's known that PMF or proton motor force is needed for the uptake of aminoglycosides. And these cells are not fully dormant, they're quasi-dormant. So there's enough activity that once the aminoglycoside gets in, boom, the aminoglycoside can kill each and every one of them. And so we're very excited about this possibility. We did this in gram-negative E. coli, like e. Co uh, gram-negative bacteria like E. coli, but we also did it in gram-positive bacteria like staph. We went further and looked at biofilms. So bacterial biofilms are these communities of bacteria surrounded by an extracellular polysaccharide matrix attached to a surface. Bacteria and biofilms are highly toler tolerant. The thinking in the past was that the reason you can't kill them off is that they're protected by that hour layer. I think they're in part protected. But in fact, studies have shown that the antibiotic can penetrate through and get to the bugs down low. And so the question was, well, why couldn't they kill them off? And it turns out because they were in this persistent or quasi-dormant state. And we were able to show in vitro that, that is outside, these, outside an organism that these different upoglycotic sugars could enable aminoglycosides to eradicate E. coli biofilms as well as staph biofilms. Well, we then went, the next step, and did an animal study. And what we did was look at a catheter-based biofilm model. So catheter, in this case, it would be in a mouse uh, up, up into the urinary tract. And it already had a biofilm infection on it. And it was an E. coli one. And we looked at delivering gentamicin alone and gentamicin along with mannitol. So mannitol was one of the sugars that we gave. It's used in sugarless gum. So it's not well metabolized by mammals. 
And what we found was that by including mannitol, we, we could substantially boost the killing efficacy of gentamicin against the biofilms. We could eradicate the biofilm infection in the mice. And most stunningly, further stunningly, reduce the spread of the infection to the bladder and the kidneys of the mouse. So we're very excited about how this might be useful now to go after chronic urinary tract infections, how this might be useful to go after ear infections, lung-based infections, staph infections. We have early data to indicate that it can be applied to pseudomonas inside the lung. Now, we just did it in vitro, but it's often a lung-based infection that, for example, is highly problematic for cystic fibrosis patients. We showed that mannitol, as well as other sugars, could be used effectively with tobramycin, which is aminoglycoside used to treat pseudomonas infections in CF patients. Well, it turns out there, and that's offered by Novartis, there's a company that's looking to aerosolize mannitol. So the idea would be in tobramycin in aerosolol fashion that you could combine these two to treat the lung-based infections. We're now digging in to see could we come up with metabolic synthetics that could do the same. So not simply using sugar. Some of these sugars would be problematic because they are well metabolized by the body, so it's unlikely they'll get to the infection site. Mannitol is an exception. We're now trying to look and use similar approaches to see could we extend this to quinolones and beta-lactams. In part, I mean, like I said, it's going to be highly toxic. And in many cases, you'd want to treat with quinolones or beta-lactams. And we have early data to indicate that part, in part, these drugs are not effective against the, the persistence because you can't, they can't actually be taken up by the persister. So we're now exploring insights into how those drugs could be taken up to improve the killing efficacy. And we're hopeful that these general approaches will turn out to be quite valuable for treating a range of persistent and chronic infections. The beauty of the sugar, including mannitol, is it's an incredibly cheap solution. And so one can envision going after TB infections, pseudomonal staph infections, in the developing world, where the antibiotics are available, somewhat cheap in some cases, but the treatments uh, have not been effective. And we're hopeful that this could reduce morbidity and mortality around the world in the face of chronic recurrent persistent infections. I think the, the major disadvantage of any such approach antibacterial will be what level of resistance can arise. In our case, it's the challenge we have is can we find appropriate metabolites or metabolite synthetics that can get effectively to the site of infection and yield their effect. When we published our work, which we published in Nature now two years ago, we actually had a number of parents expressing concern, are you telling me now I need to give my kids sugar to treat the infection? And we're not necessarily saying that. Uh, but one, you know, once you speak about adding sugar, there's always there's certain negative connotations from the public that we need to overcome. And I think in the case of mannitol, the beauty again is that's a non-metabolized, so you won't have many of the problems that you have with things like glucose. So looking further, I, I think the field will develop pretty dramatically in the next five to ten years as we learn more about the biology and the physiology of the persisters themselves. They've been incredibly hard to study because they make up a tiny fraction of a living population. And so to actually pull them out and study them using high throughput means to look at the gene expression, the metabolites, the protein, has been incredibly challenging, if essentially impossible. And so many uh, insights are waiting to be discovered. And I think as we learn more about their physiology, we'll be that much more effective at preventing their formation and or eradicating them once they're formed. So uh, almost all of the experiments on persisters are in vitro. And so another major challenge for the persister community, which is growing, is to develop effective in vivo animal models to enable you to study what happens inside an organism. And we, even in vitro, have been very limited in what we know about these. But as we expand that to become clinically relevant and more effective, we absolutely need to move these efforts inside animals uh, and there, there are big challenges in, uh, right now, few, if any, efforts to try to develop such animal models. There's concern, that does work in a, in a mouse translate well to a human? And I think those concerns are very well validated for complicated diseases such as cancer. I think animal models for infectious disease of a bacterial fashion have been more effective, though there still is a big barrier. Uh, I think w we really know very little about what antibiotics do inside an organism. Mice, rats will be an, an important step to expand upon. I think moving toward means to actually make measurements on human patients will be quite exciting in the next decade or two as we develop non-invasive imaging abilities.
to see what's happening inside that patient. Again, I think we know very little about what's happening at an infection site and what is happening in, as a result not only of the development of the infection, but in response to the antibody treatment. So our lab hasn't very quickly moved from in vitro to in vivo because much of our expertise is in the in vitro space. And there was still so much to be learned that it's much easier to do in vitro experiments than it is to do in vivo. They're cheaper, they're faster, less regulatory burden. But as we look to have the impact to show the potential clinical relevance, our lab increasingly in the last three years has moved toward animal studies. So many of our studies now will have an animal component. We've not yet moved toward human studies, and there is a whole other level of complexity. Time involved, you have issues of safety, you know, is it warranted, and money.